This slideshow will focus on the War of 1812 between America and the British. In the election of 1808, after Thomas Jefferson's second term, he decided, just like George Washington had after eight years and two terms, that he would not run for president again. At, at this point, it was not required that you only run for two. It is today, but back then it was not. He just had decided to follow George Washington's precedent and not run for president again. So the Republicans chose James Madison to run for them. And at this point, the Federalists were starting to lose power everywhere but in New England. And so um, he very easily, James Madison, very easily won the election against the Federalists. Um, and the Federalists had chosen Charles Pinckney as their uh, candidate. At this point in history, though, these tensions from all of these trade issues and everything like that with the British were really, really starting to rise and starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bubble to the surface. And James Madison was the man who would eventually have to decide if he wanted to go to war with Britain or not. And so that was kind of the mark that was on his presidency from the very beginning. So James Madison, just like Thomas Jefferson before him, did not, absolutely did not want war. Okay, but again, the feeling of the American people was, here's America in the middle. We got France reaching in our pocket and messing everything up. We got Britain reaching in our pocket, taking our money and messing everything up. And so Madison decided um, that the way that he was going to try to avoid war is he was going to ask Congress to go through with the Non-Intercourse Act. The Non-Intercourse Act essentially said, we will not trade with France or Britain, but the president can reopen trade um, for whichever country lifted it first. So if France lifted it first, then we could start trading with them. If Britain lifted it first, we could start trading with them. But Congress looked at that plan and they decided something completely different because they realized that our pockets were being emptied. Um, our merchants were losing all of their money and stuff like that. And so they decided on Macon's Bill Number 2 which reopened trade with both countries. So instead of saying no trade until they fix it, it said, okay, we're gonna open up with France and Britain. And then if one of those countries, France or Britain drops the restrictions, we would stop buying goods from the other one. So if France decides to drop the restrictions, we'll stop buying stuff from Britain. If Britain decides to drop restrictions, we'll stop buying stuff from France. And the first one to budge in that was Napoleon of the French. And he said, we won't restrict American trade. We'll still stop them and take their goods if they um, come by us, but we won't restrict them. Um, and Britain said, we're not going to do that. Okay. And so Congress passed a non-importation act, just like they said they would. And they said, we will not import or buy any goods from Britain at all. Now, Britain did eventually try to lift their restrictions but it was too late. They tried to do it in the June of 1812, and while they had made the decision before the war started, uh, the declaration of war had already happened before the communication happened, because it's not like you could just pop on the internet and send an email or um, jump on a phone and call each other. That stuff didn't exist at that point, so it took a long time to communicate, and so while, both, or while Britain had done what America wanted them to do, America had already declared war on them by the time they did it. The people that wanted war so desperately at this at this time were known as the War Hawks. Um, and the War Hawks were the, in particular, the members of Congress who were really, really pushing hard for this war to happen, for us to go out and fight against the British and show what we were made of. Um, most of these people were from the southern states and from the west. The people in New England really didn't want to fight this fight. They didn't think it was... Um, a good idea at all. But the reason that these war hawks, these southern and western people wanted war, is kind of a reputation thing. If we let Britain put us, push us around, then we're going to look like this tiny little baby country, which we kind of were, but we didn't want to show that. We wanted to show how tough we were. And so we didn't want our rep reputation to kind of slough off because we're kind of letting Britain do whatever they want to us. Second off, these trade restrictions that Britain was putting on us, they're capturing our cargo and stuff like that. That was really hurting the farmers, the people from the West and the South that were farming, because they made most of their money uh, shipping crops over to Europe. Here's a little bit of a typo here. Okay, this, this is supposed to say made. Okay, they made most of their money shipping uh, crops across Europe. Um, the British 
also were thought to be arming natives. So those people that were all the way out on the edge in those frontier forts, they were thought to be giving the natives weapons and kind of trying to incite them to attack those western farmers, which was bad for those people as well. Take a minute to write out the answer to this question. At this point in history, there were a lot of problems with some natives as well. Um, a lot of people thought that the reason that these natives were starting to fight back was because Britain was, you know, getting them whipped up and giving them weapons and all that kind of stuff. But really, the reason that the natives were starting to get upset is because new speculators, remember those speculators are people who are trying to make money, and then settlers wanted more and more land. And so the, the natives were losing their land to these speculators and settlers, and so they started to resist. <clears throat> and this man up here, his name was Tecumseh. He had a theory. His theory was that one twig, one stick will break easily. But if you make or put together the sticks in a bundle, it is impossible to break them. Okay, and so he was the Shawnee leader, and he said if we can just unite the natives, put them all together to defend the land, it will be much harder to defeat than it is just one tribe. So it's easy for the Americans to defeat one tribe at a time, but if we all come together, it will be much more difficult. Okay, and then his brother uh, Tenskwatawa um, was known as the prophet. He wanted to bring the natives together spiritually. Okay, so he was seen as a prophet that wanted to bring them together spiritually. So they kind of worked together. Um, and this is in because of this, because of the unite, uniting the natives and defending themselves, the Battle of Tippecanoe happened. And the Battle of Tippecanoe happened... Uh, right here on the Tippecanoe River. Really, it was kind of the battle happened right in that area. Okay, um, Tecumseh had gone from his house or from his land, this red dot right here called Prophetstown. He would he had gone down south to get together with some other natives and try to unite them and bring them up into his group of people, his bundle of sticks. Right. Um, and at the same time, William Henry Harrison, this man right here, later to be president, at this point just a general, went to Prophetstown to stop the natives. The native er, er, because Tecumseh was gone, right? And so the native fighters intercepted them at this big area that I circled right here, okay, by the Tippecanoe River. Uh, the fight happened, and about 150 on each side died. Uh, but America claimed victory. When they claimed victory, the news spread that they had won this battle. And the native confidence in the leaders started to fall off. And a lot of these natives ran away to Canada. Many of them uh, ran up there, and even Tecumseh ran up there himself. And what a lot of Americans thought is they looked at this and they said, you know what, that's proof that the British were helping them because they ran to Canada, which is owned by the British, and so they ran away to their buddies, the Brits, okay? And then they also uh, looked at the weapons that they had been using, and they had been using British-made rifles. So they said, you know what? These British have been giving them weapons and trying to get them um, as allies to fight against the Americans. So in June of 1812, President Madison asked Congress to declare war, and they voted and decided to declare war on Britain for all of these reasons. The southern and the western states we know wanted war. Okay, the northeast, however, did not. So the people of America were deeply divided, and the people in New England, people in New York, were calling it Mr. Madison's War, implying that, you know, we didn't even really need to um, show or we didn't really need to do it. It was just Madison doing it kind of on his own. Um, and a lot of the reasons for this is America just wasn't ready for war. We had just gotten a president for the last eight years, Thomas Jefferson, who had made the government and the military and all that kind of stuff smaller. And so at this point in America's history, there were less than 7,000 troops total in the entire army all combined. Uh, how do you fight against one of the most powerful nations in the world with that? They also didn't have enough equipment to fight. They only had 16 total ships in the entire Navy. And again, like we talked about before, public opinion, what people thought of the war was very, very divided. Some people were for it and some people were very against it. And kind of last but not least, the National Bank had really caused a problem because, you know, the Re Democratic Republicans didn't want this National Bank. OK, and so the charter had ended and so because the charter ended for the National Bank, 
the America could not take any loans to pay for the war at all. And so um, they were trying to get these loans from private banks, but the private banks were from the Northeast, okay, from the New England states, and they knew that, or they uh, didn't want to give money because they were against the war. And so the National Bank was eventually rechartered by the Republicans, by James Madison, to kind of try and fight this issue at least. But all of these issues were kind of just signals that we were not ready to fight a war against such a superpower. So what America decided to do first was to invade Canada. They wanted to kind of jump in and take this land and, and take it for themselves to expand America and get even bigger. And so they attacked in three different places. First, they attacked, attacked from Detroit. Okay, And so they attacked attack from Detroit. And what ended up happening, you can kind of see it on this red line right here, is some of the troops came... Um, and moved from the Navy all the way across Lake Erie and they came down in here and they surrounded Detroit and forced uh, William Hull the general of the Americans to surrender and give up their forces this was one of the first parts of the entire war it did not look good for the Americans at all okay and so a big giant city Detroit in America had been taken and then also they wanted to fight in uh, Niagara Falls right here Okay, and so what ended up happening, I'm going to erase a little bit so you can see the map, okay, is what ended up happening is at Queenstown, the British took up these defensive positions at Queenstown Heights, and so you can kind of see it right here, okay, and they were easily able to fight off 600 American troops. Now, there was supposed to be more troops who were there to fight them, um, but the New York militia came all the way up to that area and they would not cross the border because they said that according to the laws they were not required to leave the country to fight um, another group of people went up the Hudson River Valley um, and they went towards Montreal and again they got to the border and General Harry Dearborn called off the entire attack because his troops, again, would refuse to cross the border. They said they were not required to cross the border. So these three areas where we tried to invade Canada and take land, land from them completely failed, um, which was a very bad start to the war for America. Take a minute to answer this question. So the invasion of Canada kind of continued. Um, but became a little bit more successful for America uh, because Commodore Oliver Perry, an American in charge of a, a fleet of ships, um, started to build this, this brand new fleet of top-of-the-line ships right here on the coast of Lake Erie. So he's building these ships, and on September 10th of 1813, these new ships decided we're going to go in and we are going to attack the British fleet. And so you can see this blue line running through Okay, that blue line came through and they battled these fleets for four hours. So they battled them for four full hours and they had um, won after these four hours. Very, very long battle. And he said, dear general, we have met the enemy and they are ours. And what they got out of it was two ships, two brigs, one schooner and one sloop. So they had taken some ships and um, expanded their own navy by taking the British ships that they had defeated. Um, and so that was a big boost in American morale. Um, and this also allowed the Americans to not be threatened by that navy. And they were able to push themselves back in and take Detroit, um, as you can see in these uh, kind of green now I've made them green, but they're blue arrows on there, okay? Um, the blue arrow shows you this one right here. That they were able to cross that um, Lake Erie with no hassle from the uh, British Navy and go in and attack the British in the Battle of Thames. General William Henry Harrison was there, and he had taken back Detroit, marched into Canada, defeated a force of British and natives at the Battle of Thames, and eventually continued to push in. The attack was stopped and the Americans retreated back to Detroit, but they had taken back that city that was originally theirs. And so really, by the end of 1813, America had won some fights. 
the British had won some fights, but really, America had gained no territory in Canada, which was the whole point of invading it, so they had kind of failed at that. And then in 1814, British, who had been fighting with France also at the same time, so they had to have half their troops over there, realized that they had just won, and they finished their war with France because Napoleon had kind of fallen apart. And it was over, and now the British could really focus on America, which became a very scary proposition for the Americans. So now with a renewed focus in the war in America, the British came and landed a fleet um, in Chesapeake Bay, and they sent a, a bunch of troops in, and really they had easily defeated the militia that was there um, in the way of them, and then they marched into the capital completely unopposed. They didn't have to fight anybody at all, um, and the government officials were fleeing at this time, running away. It was really a terrible look for America, and the British actually burned the White House and the Capitol building to the ground, so they went into the capital of America and burned it to the ground, okay? And then they tried to go up the... Uh, coast a little bit up the river a little bit and attack Fort McHenry and attack the uh, the city of Baltimore in Maryland um, and when the British tried to attack Baltimore the the militia fought back and were able to hold them back okay and then the ships started to bombard and attack um, Fort McHenry and um, the fort right here you can see okay and at this point the Fort Fort McHenry had put up this giant flag. It was enormous, and they put up a flag so big that the British had to see it, okay, um, and just kind of to send a signal of, you know what, we're not going away no matter what you do. And all night, the British attacked and attacked and, and shot and shot at this fort, and they were able not able to take it down, not able to get the Americans to quit, and so they abandoned the attack. And Francis Scott Key was a man uh, who was watching, he was an American man, he was watching from a British prison ship that he had been captured onto, and he woke up in the morning and saw... That after all that shooting and all that craziness, the flag was still waving and had not been taken down. And so he was inspired by this, by seeing this, uh, to write the Star Spangled Banner on the back of an old letter that he had with him. And so the Star Spangled Banner, as you know, a poem that later got turned into a song that would become our national anthem. So um, kind of an interesting thing there. And so at this point, New England just really felt like they weren't being heard. They didn't want to be a part of the war. They just didn't want anything to do with it. And they didn't feel like anybody was listening to them. Some of them wanted to secede. They wanted to leave the country. Uh, but really, that kind of got shut down really quickly. Um, and, but they did get together, many of them, in the Hartford Convention. And they were a bunch of Federalists that called to make amendments to the Constitution that would increase their power. Now, this looked terrible for them because everybody at this feeling, or at this point was kind of coming together with this war and trying to think about the USA and think about the country as a whole and these people looked like they were unpatriotic and they were just trying to grab power for themselves and they never really recovered and the Federalist Party never really had any true power after this. Um, the war did end on December 24th, 1814, the Treaty of Ghent. Neither side really won, um, neither side really got much out of it and so um, <clears throat> Yeah, so that's that's kind of, it, it just wasn't really a victory for either side, but they both kind of, you know, tried to claim victory. Um, and after that had even happened, or after that had happened, on January 8th, 1915, a bunch of British sh uh, ships came into New Orleans and 7,500 British troops landed. Now again, remember, it's not instant communication. So even though the war was over, it had not been communicated yet to these people. And so these troops landed, and there was a battle that happened there. And there was a new general for America, General Andrew Jackson, who led his troops and had a, just a dominant defensive victory in this. And Andrew Jackson became a national hero, and this idea of nationalism started to grow up. Okay, so one of the huge effects of the War of 1812 and Andrew Jackson's battles and all these battles was an increased feeling of nationalism, which is loyalty and pride towards your country. It's that idea of USA, USA, right? You're not worried about yourself. You're not worried about your part of the country. You are just having pride and loyalty to your whole country. 
Um, and not only did it do that, but it also improved the United States' reputation overseas. So it improved how other countries saw us and the power uh, that we looked like. Take some time to write out the question, three questions that you have for the notes so far. If you don't have any, write out three test questions.